Hi, welcome to NDE TV. I'm Peggy Robinson. Today's guest is Bill Tortorella. I said it right. Yeah, Bill Tortorella, you got it. <laughs> okay. And um, you're going to share your near death experience with us today. Uh, yes, I am. Can I, I ask you something real quick? I should have asked before we started, but that's fine. I saw some, I read something about you, about uh, Jesus Christ Superstar Broadway show. Oh, yeah. That's fascinating. Yeah, I had, uh, they had WNBC radio and television had a big contest in New York City. And uh, I think it was now, when, the, when the show came out, it was before I left New York. So I think it was about 1971 or whatever. And that was 200 and 50 something thousand contestants and I happened to win it. So it was good. So you I were did a you painting. Did the... I'm an artist. So oh. I paint. I graduated okay. from art and design in New York City. And I I actually paint pictures for a living now. I used to have my own business for 20 years and traveled the world and did trade shows all over the country. Mm -hmm. So what did you do for the, the Jesus Christ Superstar? What was your role in that? I know you won a contest, but... Well, I, I did a, it was for WABC, NBC Radio and TV, uh -huh. and it was a it was a, a, a supposed to be a birthday card that I made. So I made it out of two four-by-eight plywood boards with hinges, and I painted a picture of Jesus on the front, seven feet high, with a... A burning village in the background on top of a mountain with uh, hundreds of people coming down with torches and crosses and everything and they got you know bigger and bigger and graduated so they on the bottom they were about two feet high and he was seven feet high and they were all reaching out for jesus's love awesome, awesome. and the paint very nice so it won thank god you know cool. do you still have it it was awesome uh, no, I donated it to a church a long time ago. Okay. I think in, in the okay. 90s or something like that. Okay. Now we got that out of the way. <laughs> so um, feel free to start <laughs> wherever you like and take as long as you like. All right. My name is Bill Tortorella. I had a near-death experience in 1994 out in Tucson, Arizona while I was doing a trade show. And uh, this particular year, a lot of people from all over the world actually comes to this show every single year. And they bring in, you know, all kinds of viruses and sicknesses because it's in February and it's the largest gem and mineral show actually in the world. And it's a two week show out in Tucson. The whole city is actually filled, the convention center, all the hotel ballrooms are filled. They actually have every spot in the city with vendors at them. So we get people from Asia, Europe, all over the United States, Canada, South America. And I've been doing this uh, for years. And every single year, there's um, colds and viruses running around and flus and things like that at that time of the year. Well, this year happened to be a killer virus or bacterial. They didn't actually know what it was. All we know is... I remember being into the show working and I had uh, two other people working with me there. And the third day, the lady across in the, uh, one of the other boots just collapsed and fell to the floor and they had to call an ambulance, get some help for her. And the ambulance came in, taking her out. Uh, there were so many people actually catching it in the, in the convention spot that I was in. So I didn't feel anything actually to the fourth day. The fourth day I woke up I felt so sick I could barely make it down to my, you know, my spots down there, my boots. But I had to, you know, go down to tell them, you know, at least I wasn't feeling good. And they took one look at me and they said, you better get to the doctors or a medical clinic or the hospital or something. So I went over to the hospital. I remember it being so busy with people because, uh, like I said, there was a lot of people sick. And they said to the they said to the crowd basically in the lobby if there's some people that would go to you know medical centers, you know that they would take us over. So they they actually took us to different medical centers around town. And what was good about that is that we could be seen right away. 
And they set me up with uh, IV drip with antibiotic in it because at the time it was it was probably viral, but they didn't know if it was bacterial or not. So they had a you know they had antibiotics in the IV, and I remember them changing out the bag a couple of times. They said my oxygen was low. I was so sick, my throat was so swollen, I could barely breathe. And at the time, I had a condition that I didn't even know I had. I had uh, something called sleep apnea. And I, to this day, I have to sleep with a m- machine to keep my throat open while I'm sleeping. Because otherwise, I'll wake up choking to death. In this case, between uh, the virus or whatever it was, and the sleep apnea, that night actually turned into a night of uh, light and love for me. I mean, they sent me home after my oxygen levels were up and they didn't send me home, they sent me back to my hotel. So after my oxygen levels were up, they said my oxygen levels were good, they gave me an inhaler and they gave me some antibiotics to take with me. And they told me if I feel the same way in the morning, make sure you get yourself into the hospital so that's when i went home to the hotel and basically i said before already it turned into a night in love i actually remember this near-death experience like it was yesterday it was so profound i remember when i fell off asleep i remember basically myself and i physically remember how i left my body I love my body through my eyes in this beautiful, beautiful, glowing mist. The green was like the color of life. The color was so magnified, and I was in it. And I remember hovering now, looking down upon my body. At the beginning, I realized this was me at the beginning. And I was looking at this body, and it looked like it was so wrapped in pain but then it started to become lifeless. And I really believe that the spirit knows and stays by the body to make sure that it's really not alive anymore before it leaves. Once my spirit realized there's no life left in that body, I remember this bright beam of light from behind me, because I'm looking down still, and now the beam of light just covers everything. And I don't remember turning, the beam turned me. So I turned into this beautiful tunnel, I call it the gateway in my book. And it just drew me in. I didn't remember having to move or anything. All I knew is it drew me into the tunnel and then I was starting to move at speeds. It felt like it was. Mo- I was moving at the speed of light. The colors that made this tunnel was so magnificently beautiful and they were it was actually the magnification i can't explain the color because the colors it was a a beautiful array of colors and if you take neon colors and try to blend them and magnify them that's what it was like but now i'm moving faster and faster and i feel nothing but embraced and loved by this light I'm actually feeling that I'm becoming part of the love in the light itself. The beauty of this, my soul was opening up. I knew this and I was traveling faster and faster. And I felt like I was traveling to the universe and seeing nebulas going by me. The colors were whizzing by me and through me. And I remember my arrival. I'll never forget the arrival. The arrival, I said, I'm home. I was speaking it. I home. Thank God I'm home. And I'm I am now greeted by other spirits, family, members. And then I hear a soft voice say, Yes, Bill, you're home in the light of our Lord, Jesus. And she introduced herself to me. She said, My name is Antonio. And I was with you on your travels home. I didn't realize. I didn't know anybody was with me. I didn't know there was another spirit with me. But she explained to me that she was the one responsible for taking me in and bringing me home. And 
I didn't quite understand all that at that time, but it, it was beautiful because I was part of this love now. And she said, these are your family and friends and, and the greetings. It was, it was just full of love. I had never felt this kind of love before. The love was at a level where I was, I was so embraced and we all became part of this beautiful light. And it was, it's like you feel, you feel God while you're there, Jesus in the light. So you become part of it yourself. But there's, you could actually communicate with others. The telepathy and the communication was so clear. She that I had two other guides. And at that time, another beautiful spirit approaches me and he said, Billy, I remember the voice. The voice was my brother Peter's voice. It was, it was magnificent. My brother Peter, the way I was a young teacher, about 15 years old, and he was 30 years old. He died of a cancer and came out of nowhere. But it was, it was Peter's voice, and he said, when he said, Billy, I was I was in awe, and I and I said Peter. He says yes, I'm Peter. And he says we have to go. Now I remember him telling me that we have to go. And I said where? And he says your life review. It's time for your life review. And he took me to another level. It was magnificent. I felt like I was in crystal cities. It was beautiful. I seen along the way spirits working in service for others. It was so beautiful, and I was part of it. And I never wanted to come back and be what I was in the past. But as we started, I felt like it was this big, beautiful, enlightened area, and all of a sudden, he's showing me things now. And it's almost... I could say like a flickering screen. He's bringing me to events of my own life. And this is the first time I see myself back in my own body. And he's actually with me now. And I am there. He's there. We're physical. And he's showing me things I've done, all the good I've done in my life. And on the other side, the bad things that I've done. So I remember when I was a, a young boy, and I remember the events I was shown. I would take my friends. Uh, you know, I, my mom and dad were all right. My mom owned the bar and grill across the street from Ebbets Field where the Brooklyn Dodgers played. And my dad was the president of a Teamsters Union, Local 804. That was United Parcel in New York. And so my mom would occasionally give me some money and I would take a group of my friends, all of them, I would take them to the movies, I would, you know, and no one took advantage of me because they they replaced their love with, with different things towards me. And it was just, just beautiful. I had beautiful friendships growing up and all the good I've done. And then they, they take me when I was a child. And then I remember them showing me when I was a paramedic after I graduated school in New York, I was a commercial artist in the city right away. And then when I first got married, we decided to move to Florida. When I moved to Florida, this was 1973. I didn't realize we didn't have any computers at the time. Moved to Florida, there was no way of doing a lot of investigations on on jobs and things. And when I when we got down there, my wife and myself my wife was fine. She was a legal secretary. Me, I was in the audit field and I was doing commercial art at this time. And I come to find out there's no advertising agencies in Miami and they job everything out to New York and Chicago. Because I went to the Miami Herald and I asked the director of the art department if I could get a job there. And he said, son, I have art directors that are lined up waiting to get in the door here. And you know, I was a new I was a newbie to the field. So he said, if you want to be in this here field, you have to go back to you have to go back to New York or Chicago, he said. And I didn't want to do that at the time. So actually uh 
couple weeks after that, there was an ad in the paper, Miami-Dade, Broward County, was starting county rescue. I became a paramedic. So they actually sent me to medical school at night. And I worked as an attendant during the day on the actual units alongside the paramedics when I was going to medical school. Well, what I experienced on that job was that that was a life of service. Um, I did I did it for some years, and the experience was wonderful. I remember, you know, because we do, we try to, you know, keep people alive and get them to the hospital. But now I'm seeing this. This is a scene I actually was shown. They show me a scene when we had left our main terminal, um, downtown Miami, and now we're heading up to our with, with our unit we're heading up to our station and our station's like on 125th street and we get a call we're on i-95 heading north now the call comes over the radio that there's a a 317 three anything but a three in front of it meant it was a, a emergency emergency car accident this was and the call that came over the radio they didn't know where we was yet because we didn't call in they had our our partners we had you know three units there so they had one of our partners they gave them the call and they said the call was on 135th street and i-95 north i picked up the mic immediately and said we're we're on one ninety about that the time when i picked up the mic we were on 95th street and one i think by the time i got finished talking we were already on 125th street 10 blocks away from the accident so we were right on the accident when it happened. We got to the accident. There was a young boy. I remember him running around like frantically, like screaming something. And then I got out of the unit with my my bag and we went running over to him. And he kept, then he pointed. And as he pointed, he's pointed to this car. And we both look over, me and my partner, Danny, we both look over. And we see this young girl has her head through the window, windshield. Well, part of her head was through the windshield. And there was blood all over. It was all over. And, and now Danny and I have to, you see, this kind of situation when there's a massive head trauma and a lot of bleeding, we have to assess it immediately and decide what we're going to do. Because, you know, a lot of times when there's an instrument or any kind in the body, you want to take the instrument and then and the body. But we, we couldn't because she was in the windshield. A well, part of her head was through the windshield. So I basically... Got on the other side of the windshield. I eased her, the part of her head back in, and Danny grabbed her, and we put her on the stretcher. And there was some movement in her body, so she wasn't dead. And I remember we got her in the stretcher. We got her on the unit, and the brother hopped in the back with me. Now, I'm trying to gore. I got the gauze pads in my hand. She's starting to move. Now her body is starting to seize, and her body is physically jumping off the stretcher like this. And I'm holding on, trying to, sorry about that. I'm holding her, I'm holding her neck with my hand up and the gauze pads down on the top of her head, just trying to hold, to stop the bleeding a little bit. We got to Parkway General Hospital so fast because it was on 170th Street, right off I-95. It was right there. They rushed her into the operating room. And then Danny and I went back to the, we went back to our station to get cleaned off. But I'll never forget the next morning. The next morning, I, I never had this urge like I had. I had an urge that I had to go back to that hospital. Because when, when you know, that kind of situation is that bad, the outcome is usually not good. But I had this need to go back. I was thinking about it all day. I was praying about it. I was so, I was asking God to help me all through the thing when I was holding her head, top of her head down with my hand. I said, Jesus, please help me, God. And I remember at that point when he's showing me, now Peter's showing me this in the life review, I remember seeing his hand come in on the top of her head. The It was it was amazing at that point. We get to the hospital the next morning. I see one of the nurses I know. I think her name was Becky. I'm not sure. And I said, Becky, how did that young lady, what happened? I said, and she said, you want to meet her? 
and I was I was thrilled. And chills came all over my body. It was it was amazing. She brought us up to a room, and she was sitting up in a room eating something. I don't know, like something little Jello or something. I remember seeing something like a dessert in a bowl. And the brother pops up and he says, yells at his sister. He said, "This is the man that saved your life." And they had our whole head bandaged up with this big giant bandage on it. The, the, the good thing for her is there was only little scrapes on her face and she was cut all around her hairline. So what was amazing, th this was amazing because we, we thought she was a goner. The hair, she was actually scalped. So her, she had no actual, her cranium was in place. So it, it didn't break when it went through the window. It was just that she was scalp, but we couldn't tell because you see all that. And, you know, you, it's impossible to tell when there's that much blood and everything. I was so happy with the joy. I was jumping up and down. <laughs> Sorry about that. I don't want to lose my. The joy was just amazing in my body. I got the chills all over it. The mother and father was there. It was beautiful to have them there and they thanked us and everything. I said, that's our job. That's what we do. And he showed me the good things, the good things like that over and over again. We've done so many for goodness sake. But then it was time to turn around. And now he showed me the bad things in life that I did. Was this your brother showing you? <laughs> My brother showed me. I'm she's showing me, but we're in a it was almost like we we're in a live live movie. It was like real life. We're still we're the only time I seen myself in my body was in two occasions when I was there in the life review and the hall of events. So now we're in this this form of the bad side and it it wasn't very nice. It wasn't very good. I mean, even the little things that I might have heard people along the way, I actually felt them. And it was not a feeling of just feeling bad. It was feeling of becoming the hurt. And I remember, like, I'll give you an example. Um, I got the divorce from my first wife when my older son, uh, Joey, was only uh, about two years old. And, you know, we do a lot of young and dumb things when we're younger. And I, re I remember that. And, you know, at the time, I didn't realize I caused that much pain. And, but now I physically became her pain. I was her pain. I was my son's pain. The pain was so bad. It got compounded so badly over and over and over and over again. I remember screaming, please, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Forgive me. And then after them showing me a whole bunch of other little things, as we all do crazy little things when we're younger and stuff like that. But thank God. Thank God. I could say this. I never really did anything that bad. But that was that was terrible what I did to my first wife. But then the it just came out like a like a veil dropped over it. I mean, everything just ended, and then we're back in spirit form again. Now I look at myself, and now I'm no longer this flowing green mist. I'm a beam. I'm a beautiful beam of light, like the other spirits was. I became this beam, and this color, like I said, was the color of life. And Peter explained to me that I had one more guardian and then my third guardian appears i had three guardians my third guardian appears and he's magnificent i could tell by his light his knowledge and wisdom was tens of thousands of years old maybe it was it was he was an old soul let's to say the least but my third guardian, I explain it in my book, that he's the person, you know, the, you get a whisper in your ear sometimes. We call it intuition. Our intuitions, our warnings. That little voice in our ear sometimes, we have to heed it. We have to listen to that voice. 
because that voice is going to put us on the right path if we listen to it. A lot of times we ignore it, and a lot of times we do the wrong things. But that third guardian, he explained to me things, and his enlightenment was so, so beautiful. And then they took me, Peter and Oren and Antonio. I remember I was at another level of this level of enlightenment was called the Hall of Events. Now, I remember them. It was almost like a big, big screen. It wasn't a theater, but it looked like a theater. Everything was crystal. The crystal reflected the light of the universe. It was so magnificent. It was beautiful. In the Hall of Events, now they wasn't showing me things that I've done in my life. They were showing me things that happened in real life. They were showing me things back before, before I was born, physically born. I remember them showing me wars, whether it was World War II or Korea, I'm not sure. But I was just born in 1952. So I was there for the Korean War, but I wasn't old enough to be in it. So I didn't know what that meant. I had no idea what that meant. But then they were moving faster and faster, and scenes were getting like clips in, in, in a movie reel. If you ever, ever remember the, how the movie reels used to go really quick, it's almost like the computers move today. The computers move so fast that we can't keep up with them. The thing about the whole of events, they would take me from event to event. I remember from the end in that war to the event in 1963 when J.F. Kennedy, the next place we stopped, we stopped in my classroom. I believe I was in the third grade in 1963, third or fourth grade. And I remember them saying, what did they say to me? My gosh. We had a speaker in the room and the principal of the school came over the speaker and he said, President John F. Kennedy was just shot. And that just put, Kennedy was loved by the people and everybody was some. I never forget of going home that day. I went home that day, my mother and a friend was sitting at the table just crying. And usually there was a lot of singing going on in my house, but uh, John F. Kennedy was shot. And from that event, they brought me through the events of Martin Luther King, through Bobby getting shot. All these major events that happened. The next event that they showed me in the Hall of Events, we were standing at the Twin Towers on 9-11. And it was very emotional to me because I had friends in those buildings. I remember there's debris all around. The debris was terrible. It was all around us. And I remember running and Orrin said to me, you don't have to run. Or Peter said, you don't have to run. And he said, my friends in the building and they explained to me that I wasn't there. This is 1994. They explained to me I wasn't there. I, quite, I didn't quite understand that, but I just accepted what they said. And I went from the, that event. I remember trying to like run in and, and help and I couldn't again. And I went from that event into the event in Baghdad. I remember it must have been Baghdad, the bombings, because there was bombings going on all around me. And I remember by the, the dress that the people wore, I, I knew I was somewhere in the Middle East, how they dressed. And people were running and there was explosions going on all around me. And instinctively, I started to run again. And they said, Bill, you don't have to run. You don't have to run. And I just stood there then. And the, the reel kept on running and uh, event and sequence and sequence events till something like today. We're at a point, we're at a point in history now where we have to choose to do the right thing. It's so simple. 
On the other side, there's only one thing, love. Love exists on the other side. We become love. We have to bring that love with us here. We have families that don't even talk to each other anymore because of politics. This has to stop. We have to bring it to a place of peace, listen to each other. First, listen to each other. Then come to, come to some kind of even ground. The beauty of it is that they show me two sides of this event. And one side was not good. One side was almost like the Mad Max days. It was terrible. Ever watched that movie Mad Max or The Hunger Games or something like that? It was a terrible outcome. And then they gave me two possibilities. They showed me a utopia that we could live in. And then it was almost like being in heaven where people help people, service. The service was so important. That's what God wants from us here. That's what we're supposed to do. Our souls and spirits grow while in service. When we give on to others in a form of a physical gift or helping people, our physical spirit is growing inside. And it grows and grows and grows over our term of our, our lives. I, I don't believe this is just our life here, our one life. I believe that we're connected to something so big, it's, it's magnificent. And the, 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 the beauty of it there is that once we get this, I believe we're going to choose because we're human. And I believe the good is going to outweigh the bad. And everything is going to be at a good place someday. The reason I believe that, because the light on the other side is still so strong. They explained to me there's a dark side, and the dark side will never win out over the light. The light will endure. Now I remember going with my three guardians to a final level. We achieved this final level, but in this level now, it's like I'm in an area that's full of Beautiful angels, magnificent glowing white angels. With they, they glow so bright, and knowledge was just pouring out of them. It's like I wanted their knowledge. I'll never forget. I wanted to, I was feeling their knowledge come into my body. And that's where I was introduced to nine principles of enlightenment. These principles, they're simple. And if we live by them, we can endure through the ages, whatever happens. Because one will help instead of destroy. The beauty of it, I had introductions with some of these angels. One angel came up to me and it was almost right beside me in this beautiful go. Now with two beams of beautiful light grown. And he's showing me these beautiful crystal. It was like waterfalls of crystal numbers. It was magnificent. They would light as they passed by. And I'd see the number one and eight, three, six, and nine. And these numbers would just light and bright, bright, bright. And I didn't know what they meant at first. But these numbers had a great importance. Now I understand what they meant. He explained to me that the one is God in the universe. The eight stand for eternity. These numbers are in our Bible. They stand for God and eternity. And not only my religion of Christianity goes by these numbers. Buddhism goes by these numbers. The Hinduism goes by these numbers. In Buddhism, they have 108 prayer beads. They say 108 prayers. And it's all wonderful because we're all connected. Everybody's connected to the same God. And it, it's it's just beautiful. And in, in Hinduism, the, in the churches, they have 
steeples, 108. Their mantras, they, they have to say 108 mantras. I come to find out this 108 and the 369 all comes together. It's the support system for us. They showed me my numbers, my physical number. They told me my life path number was three. My physical numbers of alert was 66. Now, I have to say this because this is important. The 66, I've already known my whole life. Because I remember my whole life, I'd be looking down at my watch and it's six past six. I'd look up at a sign and it's 66. I look down at the speedometer and it's 66. And in one hour, 66 will show itself to me 10 times. When that happens to me, they explain to me that's my alert from my angels. My angels are trying to get in touch with me. Whether It, it doesn't mean it's bad. It could be very good. It could be a wonderful thing as well. But they're alerting me to something that's very important. The three, the six, the nine, the, the one and the eight all come together. The reason why this all works is because one and eight, believe it or not, is a measurement system of God in the universe. And he made this earth so perfect. That here's an example. I'll give you an example. Our sun, our diameter of the sun is 864,000 miles, the diameter. The distance from our earth to our sun is 93 point some odd million miles. If you take that 93 million and divide it by the 864, you'll come out with 108. In heaven, the zeros don't exist. The one and the eight are principal. So it's actually 18. Our earth and moon are basically, the moon is 2,160 mile diameter across. The distance is 233,000 some odd miles from Earth to our moon. If you divide that numbers, those same two numbers, you'll get the same answer, 108. So 108 in our whole universe, our immediate universe, the moon's radius is 108. The sun is approximately 108 times the size of Earth. This number is telling us something. This is the number we use in our religions. We've used these numbers for thousands of years. The 369 happens to fit the 18. Because if you take the 108 and divide it by 6, it's 18. 3 plus 6 is 9, plus 9 is 18. The 369 fits everything in the universe. People talk about the Tesla numbers a lot. Those are Tesla numbers, yes, but these numbers have been around for thousands of years. Thousands upon thousands of years. And they explain to me then, after the numbers, they explain the principles of enlightenment. My principles of enlightenment were given to me as simplicity. God's not expecting us to be perfect in any way. Our first principle is we should not take a life of someone else. Nor does someone else have the right to take our life. So we can defend ourselves. Our second principle it's so important to go back to that first principle for a second. I want to explain something. It's not only taking a life. We don't know if we take a life what that person's grandchild might have done. They might have found a cure for cancer. So you're not supposed to interfere with one's life path. 
you're not supposed to get involved whatsoever. It's their life path. And your life path can't be interfered with. That's why we're a lot of our self-defense. And these are just glancing over the principles because it gets, I get really deep into them in my book. But the intuition is the second principle. That's your warning signal. That's how I explain Oren, my third angel, my guy that's been with me my whole life. He's been with me because I know he's saved me many times in my lifetime. And I hated to his warnings. And sometimes I didn't. But that little whisper that you hear in your ear from time to time, keep an open ear to that because that'll take you in the right direction. And it's important. I have stories about that that are just wonderful. Number three, the third principle is principles of choices. Now, this is a principle that God gives us. This is the one power that God gives us. God gives us that principle of choice. That's where I could say we as humans mess up. Because sometimes we know we're making the wrong choice, and we make it anyway. The choices are very, very important. Now, all these principles, they run into each other just wonderfully. The choices will predict an outcome. Every choice has an outcome. We have to remember that and jot that down. Because every action begets an, another action. Our fourth principle is our principle of service. This principle is our number one principle in the universe. Our service to others, our gifts to others, in a form of actually doing something. And I believe I was gifted this because of that. what I did when I was younger, while I was a paramedic. I went for years and years and just you know, trying to help and save and, and do all I can to keep people alive. So our principles of service, you don't have to be that, of course not. But in, in a lot of ways, a lot of people just give money and things like that. Money is great service, don't get me wrong. Money is wonderful to gift to people that need it because that definitely helps when you can't help physically. But when you get a chance to help physically, you should. I remember just a couple of years back, I was at a water park here in Orlando, and a, a guy started to seize on the ground. I, I went over to him, I ran over to him right away, and, you know, I'm older now, and it's not in the greatest shape. I put on a lot of weight, but, but I jumped right into old form. I remember how I used to be a paramedic. I remember exactly what I did. We had these little... Uh, they were like big tongue depressors. We would have three together and we'd wrap them up with um, a tape, a gauze tape. And we would stick that in the side of their mouth so they wouldn't bite off their tongue. And this guy was bleeding when I got to him. And his bleeding, I'm, I stuck just the tip of the corner of the towel in his mouth. So he couldn't bite down hard enough to go through his tongue. And I put his head in my lap because he was banging his head on the ground. I put his head in my lap and put my arms under his shoulder because you you can't stop a seizure. You got to wait for it to stop. And I remember doing that. I remember people coming up to me after I did that and say, why did you do that? I said, why did I do that? The guy came out of it after about a minute and a half. He came out of the seizure, but it was a long seizure. And I know a minute and a half doesn't sound long, but it's long while it's happening. So our service is important that we do. And, and, and react to things and just don't ignore them because every single time we do something of service, our spirit grows. Our spirit is probably the most growth is done during that time. So we have to give as much service as we can to others and help others. That's why there's, there's people that have been living angels on this earth. I, I named quite a few in my book, Maria Espinosa, Shrine of Britannia, Venezuela, quite a, quite a few others. 
The fifth principle. When we ask God to enlarge our wealth, it doesn't mean to enlarge our wealth just monetarily. It means to enlarge our wealth in spirit. So when we ask God to enlarge our wealth, he will enlarge our spirit first. I'm not saying wealth won't come. Wealth could come in prayer. There's prayers that everyone should do out there on a daily basis. But it's so important that we, that we, you know, when we ask, don't ask just for ourselves. If we include others, it, that's important as well. A sixth, a sixth is a powerful, powerful principle of enlightenment. That's a principle of lessons. These are gifts that we get from God. Some people realize and know how to get them on a daily basis. Uh, learn the prayer of Jabaz, and you'll find out what the secrets are about that. I mean, our lessons are given to us, and the beauty of that, our lessons, we get these gifts that come to us on a daily basis. They could just, when I was in business doing my trade shows for over 20 years, I remember in the in the later 90s, they were putting angels on everything. And I was selling a big line of jewelry and watches. And I remember putting watches. I put angels on a, a about seven different watches. But I made a pendant watch that I sold on QVC with the Raphael angels in the corner with floating crystal stars and moons. I did that because of my near-death experience with the crystals in a lucite case with surrounded by a gold rim. And it was a beautiful little pendant watch. And I realized this. I woke up one morning, I started drawing out pictures of it. Two weeks later, my manufacturer had a, a prelim of it made up already. And uh, the angel watch came out beautiful. I took it to QVC and I had to go in with a lawyer. And th this was amazing because I brought in about 600 different watches with me and they only picked out about five. And I walked out feeling bad because he picked out the pendant watch. Yes, but he said, We'll we'll take a hundred of those. And I'm, I walked out with the with the lawyer, and I'm somber, and and he was yelling, "Yes, yes, yes!" And I said, I said, I forgot what his name was, Nick or Mike or something. And I said, I will. He owed me all a hundred watches. I said, that's not a big order, especially when you're you're working on a small margin. And he turns around to me. He said, Bill. They just ordered a hundred thousand angel pendants. I almost, I almost fell to the floor. I didn't realize when they said a hundred, they was talking in the thousands. So it was amazing. These are lessons that we get as gifts from God. So this is so important for our lessons, and we should take advantage of them when we do get them because they're just, they're they're wonderful gifts, and that that's how people in life, you know, some people in life go to different levels of achievement because they, they do work on those gifts as an everyday thing, practically. The seventh principle, to me, falls in place as, I can't say one principle is more important than another because the power of love is probably the most beautiful thing closest to God that we'll know in our lifetime. So if we know love here, and we could magnify that feeling, again, like I did the colors, but in love this time, magnify that feeling by thousands of times, then we'll know what God is. The beauty of the power of love, there's different stair steps of this power. And it goes all the way from the love of children to the love of our spouses. I mean, all the way up the ladder to the love of Mother Earth. That's my actual ninth principle, so I skipped one. But it's, it's part of the love as well. Our Earth is our juggler vein. 
we live from our art. Our earth feeds us. Our earth nourishes us. Our rivers are our water. Our, our oxygen comes from our trees. So the love for Mother Earth is extremely important. That was number nine, so I'll skip on number nine. But Mother Earth is the most important part because without the Earth, we would cease to exist. Our body is supposed to be a temple. It's number eight. We're supposed to keep our bodies as good possible shape that we can to live out our most years on this earth because we're here for one thing and one thing only. We're here to feel. When we're on the other side, when we're in heaven, there's one feeling, a feeling of service and love in heaven. That's what our feeling is in heaven. Here we get to feel sadness, pain, illness. We have all, all these feelings. But the, the beauty about that is that you, you have to you have to feel this. It's so important. And those are the nine principles because the, the Mother Earth was the ninth principle and that is so important. So you had the power of love. You had the body. That will keep the body in good shape. And the reason for that is we're supposed to live out as many years as we can because our spirits grow when in part of this enlightenment as we live on Earth. That's where our spirit gets strength. At the end of the ninth principle, a beautiful spirit approaches me and asks me to return. The beautiful, young, glowing spirit approaches me and asks me to return. You must return. You must return. And I said, I don't want to return. I remember I'm at this point practically begging to stay. I says, I'm home in the light of God. Why must I go? Why must I go back? I I don't want to leave. Please, please. And then she repeated it again. And then she repeated it for a final time. You must return. And she gave me my numbers. I am six of six. I didn't know what that meant at the time. I had one son. I had one in my wife's belly being born in 1994. He was being born some months older. So, but she gave me this gift. She sent me back for a reason. I'll never forget being drawn back after that. I had no idea. I was whisked back. I always felt like it wasn't like going. It wasn't so beautiful. I felt like a rag doll being pulled back into things because I'm looking at my physical body now. And I wake up. I will never forget this. I took in air for the first time. I was breathing like, <laughs> just like that. But the only thing that moved in my body was my throat. I couldn't move my limbs. I could have no feeling whatsoever. And the it was terrible. So I'm sitting there, laying there, just perfectly still. But now I'm breathing. But I'm back in this body. I'm back in this pain again. I'm missing what I just came from. And I was saying, why? Why did I come back? Why did I come back? About five, ten minutes later, I started getting tingles down my hands and legs. I remember calling and asked for help. Next thing I remember was I'm in the hospital. And they, they got me on oxygen and they're pumping me full of stuff. And I woke up there. And I had no idea. 
even I, they must have brought me to the hospital or something how I got there. But the the the, the fact is, and I'll, I'll end it with this, because in the year two thousand, my daughter was born. My daughter was born on the sixth month of the sixth day of the year 2000. And that was a miracle because she's with me today. So that's my story. Thank you. Now, um, what's the name of your book? My name of the, the name of my book is the ninth level of enlightenment, the wisdom of the light. And you can actually find the book at Amazon, Barnes and Nobles. It's on about 20 different platforms. It's in Target, it's in Walmart. It's platform, it's all over Europe. And uh, the book has a lot more in it. I couldn't explain everything on the podcast, but my Gmail is... Okay. I, I have a Gmail also. My, I have Bill, B-I-L-L, Tortorella, T-O-R-T-O-R-E-L-L-A, at gmail.com. I'm on Facebook as Bill Tortorella, too, if someone would like to reach out on Facebook. And uh, that about covers it. Okay. Well, thank you, Bill. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh-huh. Bye-bye.